it going? It's Cronkite Sports Live Time. I'm Gareth. He's Tyler. <laughs> uh, Tyler, first show of March. You know the saying goes, right? March Madness. Usually it happens towards later in the month. No, we're already first week. The madness has already ensued here at ASU. It has spread all over campus, Gareth. Men's, women's, basketball, <laughs> hockey, gymnastics. Everything is going crazy. Everything. But the first things first, what we got to talk about is last night, ASU Women's Basketball, they lost to Cal in the first round of the Pac-12 Women's Basketball Tournament. And we had reporters in Las Vegas to bring you the breakdown of what happened. We're here for Cronkite Sports recapping ASU's first round exit to Cal 71-67 at the Women's Pac-12 Basketball Tournament. I'm Jack Johnson. This is WCSN basketball writer Griffin Peters and this is WCSN basketball coverage director Gabrielle Ducharme. And Griffin, I'll start the first question with you. ASU, they were in control of this game and they really seem to be cruising into the second round, especially given that ASU had a victory over Cal just the previous week by 23 points. Then everything unraveled in that third quarter. What happened? Yeah, it seemed like ASU was going to repeat the storyline from the last game that they played against Cal on February 28th. Have a dominant second quarter, have an almost double, they had a double digit lead in this first half. They almost had one in the first half of the last time they played, and then just take over in the second half. That didn't happen. Cal adjusted to a full court press, really gave ASU's younger guards some trouble, and they had a 20 0 run that went into the beginning of the fourth quarter, and ASU could really just never recover from that. Of course, ASU did unravel. They turned the ball over a lot, as you mentioned, Griffin. But obviously, you got to give Cal some credit. They shot the ball really well, 50% from behind the three-point line. Who really stood out to you, Gabby? Uh, I'm going to be honest with you. Kid from my hometown named Kylan Crocker. She's a freshman. And since she was about 15, 16 years old, she has been able to take over basketball games like that. So yesterday was not an anomaly for Kylan Crocker. She went off for 20 points in that second half and absolutely led the Cal Bears right when they needed her the most. Griffin, Cal, they switched to a couple different defensive schemes, started the second half with the zone, then switched to the full court press. That really seemed to affect ASU, especially when Riley Richardson came out of the game. Why do you think they struggled so much against the full court press? Well, they didn't have senior guard Kiara Russell, who's a starter for them, primary ball handler with that knee injury that she's out with, that she suffered against Stanford. Without her, they lacked the experience in the backcourt to bring the ball up against high pressure defenses and to break down zones. And you saw that in the second half, they really missed her. Sarah Bajetti came in had a couple turnovers and Charlie Turner Foreman was forced to take her out and Riley Richardson wasn't able to get enough rest because of that and you could see on the offensive end Riley missed a couple open shots late and that was probably due to some fatigue. So ASU exiting this Pac-12 Women's Basketball Tournament a lot sooner than they would have hoped. Now they wait for the NCAA Tournament. The good news is they will get Kiara Russell back for the NCAA Tournament but for Griffin Peters and Gabby Ducharme I'm Jack Johnson from Las Vegas Crockett Sports. Thanks, Jack. And while well, ASU women's hoops, they could not get the job done in Vegas, and neither could ASU men's hoops last night in Tempe. After back-to-back -back losses to the UCLA schools last weekend, Thursday night set up a pivotal matchup between last place Washington with the Sun Devils desperate for a win. The Huskies, though, had other plans. WCSN men's basketball reporter Jack Lotheray has more from Desert Financial Arena. It's crunch time for the Devils. After a seven game win streak was halted in Los Angeles, the Devils were now on their back foot when they walked back into Desert Financial Arena and they looked to get back into their groove. For some, a groove is what they had. Edwards had 23 points. Verge tacked on 19 of his own. There were high highs and low lows, but the lows outweighed the highs for the Devils and they dropped their third straight game to Washington, 90 to 83. The story of the game was Remy Martin, and it was not for the positives. Martin went two for 14 from the field and one from 10 behind the arc. The second half was riddled with jump shot attempts and bricks. After the game, the message was simple from Martin. We could have got better shots. I mean, especially my shots. I mean, I think that, uh, you know, they've been going in, you know, a good amount of times this year. It just wasn't falling. I think I just need to find something else if it's not falling you know, to, to try to affect the game. But I think the quality of shots is, is you know, what we've been shooting. Um, but it's just been going in today, it just didn't. But Hurley wasn't discouraged by this performance from his leader. You know, Remy had this game, but we would never ha be in a position to have the season that we've had without Remy. So, you know, did not have it, you know, he, he uh, it's, it, this defense in particular, I think is is not built for him because of, just the size and, and the quickness of their of their four guys that, that kind of set up a wall out there. And so it's hard for him to penetrate, hard for him to 
get a clean look from three. And Washington leaves with a win and 23 points from Desiah Carter. ASU leaves with a three-game losing streak and a critical contest on Saturday against Washington State. Reporting in Desert Financial Arena, Jack Lauderay, Cronkite Sports. The high-profile Sun Devil basketball teams are hoping their struggles are negated by tournament bids, but the women's hockey squad already got and made the most of theirs. On Sunday, the best season in program history came to an end in the team's conference tournament championship with a 5-1 loss to Colorado. But on the way, the team recorded a margin of victory of plus 58 on the season with a 17-5 record. The weather is starting to warm up. The temperature is beginning to hover around the 80s, and it's time for football season? Well, that's right. ASU football kicked off its spring practices last week as the Sun Devils prepare for Season 4 all aboard the Herm Train. For more on what's been going on the past two weeks, here's our own WCSN spring football reporters, Cole Topham and Ethan Ryder. ASU football is back. The energy here at the Bill Kajikawa practice facility in Tempe, Arizona has been fantastic over the last two weeks, but no player has been as animated as senior wide receiver Frank Darby. Darby went down with a calf strain during the first week of practices, but that hasn't stopped him from being his overall goofy self and shouting words of encouragement to his teammates from the sideline. After initially being placed in a walking boot, Darby is now free of any support for the time being. After Friday, ASU has eight practices remaining, culminating in their final spring practice on March 28th. As a 5'11", 218-pound running back, Diamante Trainum out of Akron, Ohio, has been very good for the Sun Devils so far in spring practice. He was ranked the number four recruit by ESPN out of Ohio and one of six top 300 nationally ranked recruits that ASU recruited this year. So far, he's looked fast, strong, agile, and everything else you would want from a possible starting running back. Taking a five-minute walk from Herm Edwards' practice field to Trisha Ford Stadium, the Sun Devils softball squad took on Wright State last night, and our Spencer Chihawk was there to recap the action. If you had heard that Arizona State was up 7-0 at the end of the first in Tempe, your mind would automatically go to Sun Devil Stadium. This was not the case Thursday, because it was here in Farrington Stadium. The first inning is where everything went wrong for Wright State. Jasmine Hill started the scoring tear with a two-run shot before ASU took ball four, four times to score the third run and set the stage for Mencken Harper. As soon as we put her in the lineup, she's like, "We're not, you're not taking me out. And um, she's competitive. She has that Harper competitiveness. It's inbred in that family. So uh, she's worked her tail off, you know, and, and she's had some up and downs in order for her to get here. And, um, you know, failure is the best best teacher, and she's done a great job with her opportunities and just really proud of her. The runs kept coming in the second with two more home runs. First, Maddie Hackbar launched her seventh home run, followed by Danae Chapman with her fourth. Kendra Hackbar's single brought in the twelfth and final run. Carly Turner righted the ship for the Raiders, being the only pitcher to throw more strikes than balls. ASU starting pitcher Samantha Mejia pitched three one-hit innings and earned her third win. Lindsay Lopez pitched the final two innings, giving up no hits and striking out two. For Cronkite Sports, I'm Spencer Chihawk. From destroying softballs over the wall to destroying team bases, that's kind of what League of Legends is all about, and not many collegiate teams have done it better this season than ASU Esports. The ASU League of Legends team completed an undefeated 6-0 record in college LCS West Conference play, earning the number two seed in the West Conference playoffs. ASU and UC Irvine are the only two teams to remain undefeated after the regular season. The Devils will face off against Cal in the first round on March 14th. Now, let's trade those sticks in for some bats and head to the diamond where the Sun Devil baseball season is in full swing. After a sleepy start offensively, it looks as if ASU might just be capturing some magic at the dish. And our reporter Peyton Gallagher takes you on a trip around the bases and explains what's what with the Devils offense. If you've been to Phoenix Municipal Stadium during the last couple of games, you've heard the phrase, fear the fork, fear the torque, blaring out of the intercoms fairly often. Teams have just chosen to walk Torkelson instead of dealing with what he can do at the plate. The preseason All-American has been walked on over 40% of his plate appearances so far this year, 
which is 10% more than anyone else in the nation. Even still, the slugger is sixth in the nation with six dingers and has an on-base percentage that is over 600. Big man is in his bag. A lot of Torch recent success is because of the man batting behind him. Trevor Hover is on an absolute tear as of late. And as the saying I just made up goes, happy Hover, happy lineup. The outfielder has had a lot to smile about as of late. Since his game-ending strikeout with the bases loaded versus Oklahoma State, Hover has 19 RBIs and 5 homers compared to only 7 strikeouts. Most importantly in all of this though, he's punishing opposing teams for walking Torkelson. Sun Devil second baseman Drew Swift must have seen what Hover was doing and thought it looked pretty fun because the junior has maybe been the hottest bat in the lineup in recent weeks. After netting only one hit in the first four games, Swift has recorded more than one in eight of the last 10 contests. He even hit his first career homer this past Sunday versus Nebraska. Throw all of that together and what do you get? A pearly white smile on Skip's face. And for good reason, the Sun Devils are on track and bippity boppity blasting their way into conference play. Reporting in Phoenix, I'm Peyton Gallagher. The Sun Devils will try to keep that smile on Tracy Smith's face this weekend as ASU takes on Fresno State in a weekend series at Phoenix Muni. And that Sun Devil baseball squad, well, they're yet to hit conference play. But ASU Wrestling is traveling to California Saturday to compete in the Pac-12 championships. The Devils are ranked sixth in the country. But out of the five squads they'll be facing this weekend, the next highest ranked team is host Stanford, who comes in at number 24. Even without two-time national champion Zahid Valencia out there on the mats, the Devils are favorites and should come back to Tempe with a conference title. Now, it is still three more weekends until Selection Sunday determined number 13 ASU men's hockey's postseason fate. But with a 98% chance to reach the big dance, this squad is ready to make its second consecutive run at a Frozen Four berth. Our trio of men's hockey reporters Reagan Smith, Michael Gutnick, and Hunter Hippel will take a look at how ASU has gone to this point once again. Thanks, Gareth. Well, in order to be a number 13 and have a 98% chance to make the tournament, you need to have some solid wins under your belt. Fortunately for the Sun Devils, they have two huge series victories to boost their resume. First was a series sweep against then number nine Quinnipiac in November, and then one month later, a win and a tie against then number four Denver. Those impressive wins showcased the new pieces on offense kicking into high gear. Junior transfers James Sanchez and Willie Neerham have made the biggest impacts. Sanchez became the first Sun Devil to tally 40 points in a single season with his premier playmaking skill set. Neerham put up a career-high 15 goals and 24 points with his aggressive net front presence. Those two, along with the young blue line core, have paddled relentlessly all season long to get to this point. If we are talking about change between this year and last year, then there isn't much to talk about. ASU upped their win total from 21 to 22 this season, a new program high. But perhaps the only change that the team experienced was their expectations. Last year, there were none, zero. This year, that changed, and they still stood up to the task and delivered with another likely NCAA tournament appearance. From the cold of Oceanside Ice Arena to the on-fire Gym Devils in Desert Financial, our Rachel Phillips has the story of three freshman phenoms leading ASU to success on the floor, bars, beam, and vault. The departure of six Devils last season forced the recruitment of six freshmen, three of whom are springing the Sun Devils to new heights all around the gym. We're really pleased with what, you know, what they've given us so far and we're really pleased with their kind of their progress that they've made throughout the season. The three powerhouses have led the Devils to big victories with each dominating on an apparatus. For California Rays Juliet Boyer, bars is the place she feels most at home. With her highest score on any event coming on bars in the form of a 9.875. I feel like really relaxed on bars, which is different than the other events because I tend to get a little more nervous on those, but bars I can just relax and have fun. While Boyer shines on bars, Gracie Reeves has the title for biggest vault. In just the fifth meet of the season, the freshman debuted a Yachenko one and a half, becoming the only ASU gymnast to have a 10-point start value vault. 
but she's been training it. We knew she could do it. Um, that was our, you know, goal pretty much moving and, you know, trying to find a way to make sure that she can do it more extensively. Reeves has managed to overcome the nerves that go with competing in the college format. In front of Sun Devil Nation, she is sticking her vault time and time again. Even scoring a 9-9 along with fellow freshman Hannah Scharf. To join ASU, Scharf made a big move from Canada and is embracing every second of the experience. There's nerves for sure, but you really just have to thrive off the nerves um, and the energy in the arena. Scharf's fearlessness is proving clutch. The Devil sits within .15 of a 9-9 on bars, beam and floor, with the big scores earning her Pac-12 Freshman of the Week. Despite the achievements and stuck landings from the trio, their biggest skill for the season has been their delivery on all-around. Competing 18 times in just nine meets and notching the three highest all-around scores from any Devil this season. It's a little bit of pressure, but I think you just have to embrace it. And I think it's really cool because I know that my team trusts me and has my back and they believe in everything that I can do. While the trio of Boyer, Reeves and Scharf have another three years to impress. For Boyer, it's all about right now. It's really exciting just living out the legacy that Sun Devil Athletics has built. I'm excited to grow on that. Whether it's vault, bars, beam or floor, one thing is for sure. These freshmen are not to be overlooked. Rachel Phillips, Cronkite Sports. Thanks for that, Rachel. And meanwhile, ASU men's tennis has struggled to win on the road, but at home on the courts of the Whiteman Tennis Center, this team flips a switch. Last Friday, the Devils won a thrilling 4-3 match over UNLV in Tempe, handing the Rebels their first loss of the season. Our own WCSN men's tennis reporter Ashley Engel was there to recap the action. The Arizona State men's tennis team started the match against UNLV at a slow start as UNLV won the doubles portion of the match. But the Sun Devils didn't lose hope and knew it was up to them to perform well in their singles matches to defeat the previously undefeated team. With many players on both sides winning their singles matches, it was a tie between the two teams at a score of 3-3. Three and three. It all came down to a sudden death tiebreaker between Sun Devil Jr. Andrea Bole and UNLV's Alex Cobell. It all came down to Andrea to win the match for the Sun Devils. It's a mix, a little bit of uh, anxiety, a little bit of uh, excitement, I would say. But I'm actually used to this situation. It's not the first time this year. Uh, I haven't played the last match on. It's not the first time. Uh, as I said, also every semester I, I always get like at least one, one match as a, as a last match. After a long fight, Andrea won his singles match in three sets, having the Sun Devils defeat UNLV four and three. Head coach Matt Hill was proud of his team's performance, but he knows that they have two of the top 10 teams they have to prepare for this coming weekend. They learned uh, that they really got to come together out there in the court when things aren't going well, that they need to kind of leverage the fact that they're not there out there by themselves um, and that they're on a team and they can help each other to get through moments and matches where you know they might be down or struggling or the match is swinging the way that they don't want it to. With the Sun Devils taking this win against UNLV, they are ready to take on Baylor and Wake Forest this next weekend. The From Tempe, I'm Ashley Engel, Cronkite Sports. Good stuff from Ashley there, but in controversial news in the Pac-12 this week, one of the most polarizing figures, Larry Scott, the commissioner of the conference, is up for a contract reset. And our Sarah Abbott is here with this week's edition of Impact to give us more details on the situation. Sarah? Thanks, Tyler. Time is ticking on Pac-12 commissioner Larry Scott's future as he has two years, two years left on his contract. According to John Wilner of the Mercury News, conference officials believe a decision will come by the end of the year, if not sooner. Media rights negotiations are expected to play a huge role as talks with ESPN and Fox are in the works for fall of 2020. A contract extension means Scott would lead the charge for the negotiations that Wilner source called the most critical thing in the history of the conference. Scott's future lies in the hands of the presidents and chancellors meeting as a group next month, Anna May. 
no matter how you feel about Larry Scott and this new contract negotiation that's underway, you got to be excited because now it's time for the way it is, Gareth. We're going to ask each other three questions. You know how it works. Debate back and forth oh, yeah. a little bit. Best <laughs> debater, best arguer, whatever you want to say. Gets the monologue and the rant at the end. Are you ready to lose? Uh, no, I'm actually <laughs> ready to win, Tyler. Uh, this is my second show, man. I, I, you know I need this dub. Oh, no. You're going to play the pity card. All right, here we go. First question. So we're going to come back from our long break after spring break. March Madness is going to be well underway. Men's and women's basketball, who does better in the big dance? Yeah, I know they had a bad loss yesterday to Cal, but I'm going to say women's basketball. You know, I think Charlie Turner Thorne's team, they play with a little chip on their shoulder. They're going to be playing on the road for sure in this tournament. So don't be surprised if they make a little bit of run. I think they fare better than the men's team. All right, well, I'm going to have to disagree. Of course, men's team, if they get in, we know they lost to Washington <laughs> last night. If they find a way into the tournament, give me the men's team. We saw them get hot earlier, win seven straight. I think they can make some noise, at least more noise than the women's team, Gareth. Must win for men's on Saturday. Meanwhile, we've talked about on the show already, ASU spring football underway. What's the most exciting storyline so far for you, Tyler? Well, it's year two of the Jaden Daniels era, Gareth. It's got to right. be Jaden Daniels. This guy is one of the best, most promising athletes this campus has seen in a while and one of the best quarterbacks this, scene, this campus has seen in ever. So give me Jaden Daniels is the most exciting headline. I agree. Jaden Daniels, he's exciting, but he, he needs some help from his receivers. That's why I'm going to go Frank Darby, a little ah, stupid swole, stupid if you know. Swole. This guy, he's going to be the number one receiver. He's been following in some great receivers' footsteps already. Nikhil Harry, Brian Ayuk. So no, don't be surprised if he breaks out again. I won't be surprised on and off the field if Frank Darby is the star of this next football season. But Gareth, look, there's a lot of teams on the radar right now. You got your basketballs, your hockeys. Yep. But under the radar, what team are you looking out for over this break we're about to go on? Tyler, I'm going to go a little outside the box. I'm going to go ASU men's golf. They oh, just like won it. the Cabo Collegiate. Cabo. Cabo, yeah. What are they doing in uh, Cabo, Gareth? No, uh, not, not yet spring break. <laughs> they won the collegiate tournament there. They didn't even have their best golfer, Kevin Yu. Mm. That's how good this team is. So don't be surprised uh, if you're looking for something to watch this team better keep your eyes out for them all right you're looking for something to watch give me the asu gymnastics team Gareth. we talked okay. about rachel right. talked about the freshmen their last two matches the last two meets i should say their best two meets of the season put up their best two in and by the way two, well, two meets ago their best meet since 2006 that's oh 14 years this team's on fire right now give me asu gymnastics as the most under the radar team that you need to watch out for coming up and i think our producer should give me the way it is in this <laughs> monologue as a matter of fact tyler <laughs> I think you're under the radar here, Gareth. I think the odds are in my favor as the, on, the sports man. books are, are predicting at the moment. There it is. Yeah. Not even close. Sports are funny sometimes. As much as I think I've figured something out, in reality, I'm farther away than ever. Earlier this week, I wrote something for this right here segment about how Bobby Hurley's team deserves your trust as an ASU Hoops fan. But obviously, that was based on the assumption that they would bury the last place Washington Huskies Thursday night in Tempe. Newsflash, they didn't. And yet again, I'm reminded just how confusing sports are, and specifically this team is. When I talked to Joe Lenardi last week, he told me there was an 85% chance the Devils would be dancing in March. What does that fall into coming off three straight losses, including the team's worst of the season? I texted Joe to ask, but he's kind of busy right now, so we're just left to guess. But I may be confused about a lot of things. I'm not confused about the fact that Saturday night senior night against Washington State is an absolute must win. And for a guy like Rob Edwards that wants to make the tournament in his final year at ASU, I'm not talking about the NIT, by the way, it's the biggest game of his career. Saturday night, Desert Financial, well, it needs to be a double-digit statement win. And that's the way it is. Well, can ASU make that statement? And, you know, the couple of our ASU athletes this past week, they made some statements <laughs> with some top plays. Number three, Spencer Torkelson. He's going to go yard here against Cal State Fullerton. Look at how far this ball goes. Left center field, it's not coming back. 426 feet, 106 miles per hour, the exit velocity off the back. It's a hashtag torque bomb. Hashtag torque bomb. We love the advanced metrics. No advanced metrics needed on this one, though. Andrea Boye. Seals the win over UNLV. Seals the four and three win for ASU on the last match of the night. Look, as dark it is, that was an over three hour match for ASU men's tennis and they get the dub over UNLV. That guy's a real good tennis player for ASU men's tennis. You know, this is a first career grand slam for McKenna Harper here against Wright State. ASU softball, they hit a lot of dingers. McKenna Harper with this one over the left center field wall. This team, ASU softball, ASU baseball, that's the trend. They just keep hitting home runs and that's your top play this week. 
hitting home runs and getting walks, but Gareth, we didn't take any free bases here with this show. <laughs> no, I we think did not. This was more of a dinger, if I would say so oh, myself. Oh yeah, uh, for, you got you got to circle the bases on this one for sure. And Gareth, I'm gonna miss you over this break, and I'm gonna miss gonna being miss on Cronkite Sports Live. But that is gonna have to wrap it up for us today. For Gareth Kwok, I'm Tyler Manning. For our entire Cronkite Sports Live crew, thanks for watching. We'll see you in a little bit.